Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, the organizers have asked me when they invited me to uh, give an overview of what has been done in the last few years on this topic of self-testing. Uh, I will start, as you see here, by defining what it means and presenting the most famous example, and then the uh, second part will be more historical, see the people who have introduced the idea, and then we'll go to the developments of the last few years. Uh, in case you call this thing rigidity, uh, yes, okay, that's, that's a token rigidity as well. Uh, it's the same thing. So now what is self-testing? This is the typical device-independent setting that you must have seen many times by now. Uh, so there are two players, cannot communicate. Each player receives an input and produces an output. And then, uh, um, so the usual assumption here is no signaling. Uh, besides that, we don't know at all what this box is doing and what this box is doing. Of course, they may be the idea is that they may be sharing a quantum, st quantum entangled state here, but now in um, the problem of self-testing, uh, what we call self-testing, again, I'm not so much into words, so I would call self-testing, if you want to call it something else, I mean, feel free, right? Um, we normally, uh, the, the problem is defined by working, uh, by assuming the validity of quantum theory. And so, um, so we do assume that in these boxes, whatever is in these boxes can be described by a quantum state, and whatever happens here uh, corresponds to some quantum measurement. And the no signaling condition is captured by the fact that these uh, two measurements are in a tensor product structure. And so what we observe are these conditional probabilities here, and that's the assumption that there, there exists a state and some measurements such that this is the case. And now I can give the definition of self-testing, it's a sort of quite extreme statement, and then, and this it is. So the observed statistics self-test the state psi and a series of measurements for Alice and a series of measurements for Bob, the series goes along the index X of the, of the input and Y, if the statistics can be obtained only from those measurements on that state, up to local isometries that's going to explain in the next slide. So that's the definition of self-testing. Self-testing means that by seeing this, I know necessarily that there is, this is what's happening. <coughs> It's a much stronger statement than saying, for instance, that by seeing these, I can certify 0.5 bits of randomness per run, or I can certify 0.75 uh, bits of secret key per run. It's really only that state and those measurements are compatible with these statistics. So what does it mean, this up to local isometry? It means this, that uh, uh, the mathematics of the problem uh, goes through, so imagine, for instance, this state is a state of two qubits, we don't know what's happening here, but we can append, uh, mathematically, not in the lab, we can append uh, uh, qubit and chilla here, qubit and chilla there, and then uh, create some local unitaries here, local unitary here, that somehow swap whatever was inside into these qubits, and at the end we can check that the state that comes out here is psi, and the idea is, well, if this happens, then psi must have been already inside somewhere, and then we swapped it out. Now, of course, what it means also local isometry is that this may not have been psi. It might have been something like a locally rotated version of psi. Besides, there might have been additional systems, maybe even entangled ones, that we don't see. The measurement, whatever measurement is happening, acts only in, on, on this thing. And there may be many other resources there, we just don't see it. Okay, but at least this was inside. That's what it means, local isometries. Now, what is the canonical example? The canonical example is these. So uh, we take the CHSH bell type inequality, that is this one. And then uh, it's known that, um, is the, the textbook example, that uh, the maximum you can achieve with the uh, quantum mechanics is two square root of two. Uh, and then the self-testing statement means, for this particular result, that if one would observe CHSH equal to 2 square root of 2, then necessarily the state up to local isometries is a singlet of 2 qubits, and necessarily the two measurements on Alice uh, anti-commute are maximally uh, unbiased, and necessarily two measurements above are also maximally unbiased, and uh, well, the, the, the form is just a slight different because I chose to write the state in that form. 
alternative like could have written also sigma x and sigma z here for Bob, and then I would have written a slightly different form for, for the state. Okay, so that's the that's a statement of uh, self-testing for CHSH. It's interesting to notice that uh, uh, this condition here, uh, it's actually obtained by a unique probability point uh, that is defined like that. So, um, so although it's formulated in terms of bell inequality, maximizing the variation of bell inequality, in fact, uh, one of the things that makes it self-testing is that that maximum is achieved only for one single point. If there would be like a flat surface there of points that violate CHSH at 2 or 2, probably this statement would not be valid, or there should be something to, to be, um, these are kind of conjectures that we don't know how to deal with yet. So let me sketch the proof of that. So how can you possibly get to such a crazy result, right? Uh, so the proof goes like that. Uh, this is the part that I'm skipping. Uh, so if you write what CHSH is equal to 2 means, it's not very difficult to prove that it means that the measurements A0 and A1 and the measurement B0 and B1 with measurements with, uh, these are operator of any dimension with, uh, but eigenvalues plus or minus one only, uh, they must anti-commute. Uh, the way to prove it is essentially the way you prove the zero sum bound. So you square the CHSH operator, you find the condition to reach eight. And you find that the condition is essentially this. Now, because these guys, and there's another result that says this, because these guys, uh, the square is, a, is the identity, so essentially these are like, again, plus and minus one eigenvalues, um, there is a representation of, of this operator that is up to local unitaries. Uh, sigma z, the usual Pauli matrix, times the identity, just to make sure that, and there can be sectors where it's only the identity. I mean, this is just a simplification of that. So, but then they wouldn't anti-commute, right? So they would commute if they were only the identity. So they must be of this form. And then already this is the self-testing of the measurements. Right? So already at this point, I know that uh, A0 up to local unitary, so in particular up to local isometries, is uh, equivalent to sigma z, and uh, A1 is equivalent to sigma x. And there are some other systems on which this measurement is not acting. And then, OK, now you take that one in and uh, plug it back into ex the expression of CHSH, again, uh, half a line of algebra, and you get that CHSH expression now, the CHSH operator, looks like this. So on this sector here, for Alice and for Bob, there is something like sigma z times sigma x, z plus sigma x times sigma x. And then there are all these identities still shared between Alice and Bob that, that we don't know what they are. And now you want, now is a very trivial mathematical problem of two qubits, right? You want this operator here to give two in order to get two root two. And I mean, this is stabilizer formalism, is zz equal plus one, xx equal plus one, there's only one state compatible with that, is phi plus. And then times anything in that sector, the sector that we don't see. And this is the self-testing of the state. Okay, so that's essentially the uh, elementary proof of self-testing uh, for, for the CHSH. As usual, I mean, if you have some familiarity with Bell inequalities, you know that what can be done with CHSH cannot be done with any other Bell inequality, so it is, doesn't generalize to absolutely anything else, uh, apart from very special cases. So to prove other self-testing results is not as easy, but I think that's the idea, and I think this gives you the idea that indeed these kind of self-testing statements are possible. Great, so history. Um, well, as it turns out, self-testing was born twice, and uh, as far as I know, as far as I can guess, independently, right? There's no uh, collusion in the two processes. Uh, the first birth is in the non-locality setting. Uh, Thierson, in a 1993 kind of review paper of open problems, he said that this is the abstract, by the way, huh? four old and six new theorems without proof and 11 problems are presented. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you, you browse this paper and you find uh, the statement I just told you, the simplest scheme. So, of course, Thierson had already proved this in the super abstract Clifford algebra. Don't ask me what it means. You can ask Jamie later. Uh, but then he, okay, he bothers making a concrete example. And it's exactly the example that we just concerned with. So each, max, each state maximally evaluating basic basically each inequality is essentially the same as a single state for a pair of spin half particles. And now, he gives two references here. Right? One of them, interestingly enough, I will tell you what it is, it gives the page. Right? I don't know how often you find a page cited in a, in a reference. I would love to have it when someone cites books, but this is, a, is an article. What is that article? It's this. 
uh, it doesn't look like the kind of thing where you would find these kind of results, right? But in quantum field theory, one general setting, there are some sister algebra and other stuff. And so then you have to look very carefully. That's why Sirius has been kind enough to tell us the page. If you go at that page, you find this statement. Uh, if chi is equal to root 2, which means CHSH equal to root 2, the corresponding elements A1 and A2 and A3 form a relational Pauli spin matrices in algebra, essentially what I told you. So that's the first proof of self-testing buried in a mathematical paper. So it's not, uh, you know, this paper was not meant to discuss self-testing in any possible form. It was just something else, and this is a mathematical result that appears as a consequence of, uh, well, of the, what, what they were studying. Uh, a few years later, uh, Popescu and Rorlich, much simpler, we identified the states of two particles which yield the maximum version of Bell inequality, a straightforward extension of the single state of two spinners. Again, straightforward intention, what it means is up to local isometries, and they are the ones that give the proof that I just gave to you. Okay, so these are the, the birth through non-locality. Summers Werner, 1987, Popescu and Rorlich, 1992, and in fact, again, uh, in a paper of Tzirelson, 1990, I think, the same thing also appears. A few years later, self-testing is born again in the work of Maya Senyao, um, one of the most unreadable paper. Um, I mean, apart from the introduction, the introduction is nice, right? Uh, by the way, there is something interesting here. There are some experimentalists in the room, right? When you read the titles, you would think that they've done something very useful, namely, uh, to prove uh, quantum crypto security of quantum cryptography in a setting where there are errors, where there are, in fact, what they mean by imperfect is uncharacterized. So in fact, it's almost the opposite. The, the, the device performs absolutely perfectly, but we don't know how it works somehow. That's what imperfect means. But when you check the statistics, are the perfect BB84 statistics. So there's nothing imperfect there, uh, apart from the fact that it's not characterized. So device independent, as we call it now. And they invent these words self-testing. In fact, here they call it self-checking. There is a version in 2003 where they published, in a, they published this in a, in, a, in a journal where they use self-testing, and that's where the, the word uh, comes from. Um, now, the, the interesting thing I wanted to mention here is that this is purely cryptographic. In fact, the test is not CHSH. It's this test. It's BB84, which is this, with an additional measurement A2 on Alice, and there is a B2 on Bob in their paper, but it's not needed, in fact, uh, that is somehow in between, right? So the idea they had is, I mean, this is the, the BB84 scheme. So if I measure the same basis, perfectly correlated. If I measure different bases, no correlation. And then, well, they realized that this is not enough. And they had to complement by adding a third measurement that somehow connects the two, is in between, OK? So that's the. So now this measurement A2, well, is correlated with B0 and to B1 in the same way, and you, you can imagine where it is, right? It's x plus z over root 2. So that's the, the, the setting. Now, I have a slide about giving credit where it's due, because you know when the things become fashionable and so on, and then the, the, across all kinds of communities, we, we tend to uh, take, pick up our own heroes, right? And then, uh, um, so Werner and Summers and Popescu and Rorlich discuss the CHSH game, as we call it now, without any concern whatsoever for certification. So their concerns is purely fundamental, the structure of quantum theory, Bell inequalities in field theory, whatever that is. Nobody mentions the possibility that this could be useful for something, right? Myers and Yao, we're almost at the other extreme. The goal of certification of QKD, they don't mention at all non-locality. So they don't say anything of the type, you know, these correlations in order to be non-classical must violate some Bell inequalities. The word Bell inequality doesn't appear there. So it's a complete uh, wrong attribution. I think it's called Matthew's principle, right? When you attribute someone something to someone who has not done it, right? Because in the Gospel of St. Matthew, it says something like, uh, those who have will give it even more, and those who don't have will even be removed, whatever they have. It's called Matthew's principle because of this. And so please stop citing Maya Senyao for the CHSH game. Even if you love the CHSH game and you want to work on it, Myers and Yao did not work on it. Maybe they love it, but... Then. And uh, they invented the word self-testing, and what they actually invented is what later was called device-independent. The word device-independent comes later. 
The meeting again between non-locality and QKD happens in 2005, 2007, thanks to the work of Barrett, Pironio, uh, Barrett uh, Hardy and Kent, uh, and then uh, Pironio also, but later. Um, in fact, well, Arthur Eckert had in 1991, his protocol is non-locality meeting QKD, but then it immediately happened that BBM 92, a very important paper where the idea of entanglement-based quantum key distribution was introduced, uh, one of the things that happened there, however, the, the unfortunate thing is that they identified, well, because everything at the time was qubit, they identified Ecker 91 with an entanglement-based version of EB84. So they said something like, you know, the fact that we're using Bell inequality is essentially not critical there. And so it took some time before this idea was rediscovered, and the word device-independent comes later, but what Myers and Yao did is already the idea of device-independent cryptography. And then self-testing itself, it took a few more years to bring it back to the fore, and that's the story I'm going to tell you in the second part of the talk. So this is about developing self-testing. Um, before 2009, give or take, there were very, very few results in, in, uh, in self-testing. There are these two that I've already discussed, and then uh, uh, Manier and a few others, including Mike Mosca um, and uh, Dominic Myers was in that paper, uh, they extended the idea of self-testing to circuits. Somehow they said, okay, if I can certify a singlet, I can put my singlet into a, into a box and then certify what comes out of that box and, and so on. Right? So it looked like a sort of kind of nice curiosity. Nobody was really working in that. And since 2009, that's a list of more or less not exhaustive uh, things that we have now. Right? We've got robustness bounds. I'm going to discuss something later. Essentially, it means what happens if I have 2 square root of 2 minus epsilon, which is going to happen in the lab, right? Now we have self-testing criteria for all bipartite pure entangled states, several examples multipartite entangled state, pure. Uh, various types of measurement can be self-tested. And then there are all kinds of works on self-testing beyond the assumption of IID. Like uh, uh, all that I'm going to say here sort of assumes that each repetition of the box uh, contains the same state, but uh, for, for certification of quantum computing, uh, you don't need to make this assumption if you don't want to make that assumption. And, this thing has been generalized. So somehow what has happened is that self-testing went from being a nice curiosity to sort of a generic feature of many quantum states and, and a powerful tool for several proofs. And that's probably the reason why uh, the organizers here decided to uh, ask someone to give a talk about that. If there is one turning point uh, in, uh, in this story, again, maybe this is a bit uh, too much, but uh, uh, is the work of Matthew McCaig during his PhD thesis, what he managed to do is to write a two pages proof of the Myers and Yao criterion that anyone can do. So, to prove that the Myers and Yao criterion, so remember that Popescu and Rolli is forgotten, so the one that I showed you before, well, nobody knew. And uh, uh, Myers and Yao is this super complicated paper, not very hard to understand. And Matthew managed to do a proof of Myers and Yao that is similar to the one I showed you for CHSH, so very simple, very clear, and so on. And starting that, okay, people like me started saying, well, maybe we can work on that, right? And uh, so in fact, uh, just a curiosity, how did I get in? Well, in November 2011, there was a launch of a European project in, uh, in Geneva. Uh, Tony Athin was the coordinator, and I happened to be there, so I just listened to the, I went to the meeting. I was already in Singapore, not part of the network, and that's what I found there. So, well, these, to be. <laughs> Um, so I found all the best people in the world at the time in device independent meeting together to, uh, and to work on everything, right? So these are the topics you might, I'm sure, if you come to QCrypt regularly, you have seen talks about these things. And so I was there and I was thinking, wow, <laughs> these are friends, but they're not going to put my name on, on papers just for free, right? So uh, what am I going to do there in Singapore where these guys can take one hour train and discuss with each other every two weeks? And I'm there, I have to take 13 hours plane to get there. So uh, I realized that nobody was speaking of self-testing and I, and I went into that. Now, career advice for the young people. Uh, well, it's been no, no bed of roses, no pleasure cruise. So these are two abstracts of, except, sorry, of uh, referral reports we got in the process, for instance. I can't help but notice that looking at the bibliography, the interest toward this research sub seems to be confined in technical journals for these reasons, whatever. And now, I put this one because you spent before one hour and 20 minutes listening to Jamie speaking of semi-definite programming. Obviously, Jamie was bragging, right? Because this referee 
told us term like self testing, semi definite characterization are not really explained. I presume you're not even needed for presenting. To me, they read like sales promotion. <laughs> so, thank you for the industrial session of the first. Um, the previous hours, right? So these kind of things do happen to you, and you have to, by the way, this one was indeed rejected. This one, we managed to convince the editors that the referee was not exactly on top of the thing. Okay, a few results, and then we finish robustness. Uh, what does it mean? Okay, as I told you, robustness means that I have a self-testing distribution that I know it self-tests exactly the state, psi, and the measurements, whatever, but, you know, we go to the lab and we observe a distribution that is not exactly that one. It differs by some epsilon to, um, from this. And then we would like to make a claim on the fidelity, for instance, to say that in this case, the state that I have is not too far from the ideal state. Right? And uh, okay, there are many, many ways to do that. This is the kind of thing you get at some point. So these are criteria, for instance, for the fidelity of the singlet as a function of the, the, this epsilon for the violation of the Bell inequality in, in some... In some uh, so here, the CHSH criterion, the Meyer-Siao criterion is here, and some others. This is not necessarily optimal, but pretty optimal. It's obtained by semi-definite programs, up to some size of the problem. There are analytical bounds. The first analytical bounds by McKay, Young, and myself, and by Rachel Unger, Vazirani, uh, they go down like a stone, um, and in fact, this is optimistic. I just, I, I just couldn't put these lines vertical enough uh, because it would coincide with, uh, but essentially they, they get 10 to the minus three here, or 10 to the minus four. Uh, recently for CHSH specifically, Jed Kanievsky had found a very robust um, uh, analytical bound. So this is kind of the work in progress. For information, the Delft loophole free bell test violates CHSH at 2.42, which would be here in my scale which means that with JET's criterion, you can certify something like, uh, what is this, 65% uh, of fidelity with a singlet. Uh, it's not super robust, probably they had much better than that, but um, the, that's what we can do, and I mean, at least it's, it's certifiable, right? It's not 10 to the minus four, as in the first works. Uh, this is the result of this year uh, about uh, self-testing all pure bipartite states. Giving credit where it's due, this is just, uh, uh, I mean, there was a work by Young and Navasquez in 2014, where essentially they had the proof up to typos and up to uh, a couple of mistakes and uh, up to uh, what I, I mean, I don't want to imply anything bad for them, but I would call laziness in the sense that they decided, well, it seems to work, but we do it only for the maximum entangled state because why not, right? So essentially this paper, well, fixes the thing. But the idea is theirs, and what's the idea? I have this pure state, and uh, essentially the idea is to try to self-test by direct sums. So self-test that here, this one, up to the probability of finding yourself in this sector is this state, this one is this state, and so on. And then, of course, this is not enough. You need to self-test also. You need two inputs for Alice and two for Bob to do that, thanks to a work, again, by Young and Navasquez, fixed by uh, Stefano and uh, his student, Cedric Bams. And then you self-test uh, across the other partition. Right, now you self-test this guy, this guy, and then the last one with, with the zero, zero. And you again need two inputs for Alice and two for Bob, although it turns out that one of them can be the same measurement as before. Well, why do you care about this? Well, look at it, what it means. It means that any d times d pure entangled state can be self-tested with three measurements on Alice and four on Bob. The measurement must have d outcomes. Right? So if you think what would we require to do tomography on that state, it would require much more, right? d to the four or something like that, maybe here. The, um, here, of course, it's not tomography because it's up to local unitaries, but if you want to and, and it, did, it wouldn't work, I mean, if you get a mixed state instead of a pure state, you cannot that self-test it. You can just say, oh, I am as close as this to the pure state that would be ideal. So somehow, it's different from tomography. But if your goal is a pure state, you get a pretty good certification of how close you are up to local unitaries by only three measurements on Alice and four on Bob, any dimension. Okay, now what happens for multipartite pure states? Okay, can you prove the analog theorem, all pure entangled states can be satisfied? The answer is no. Why? Because when you go to multipartite states, starting at three, two states that are uh, one of the complex conjugate of the other may not be equivalent to local unitaries, 
Okay, two bipartite it is, right, because of Schmidt decomposition, but three partite is not. However, if I can get some statistics from the state row, I can get the same statistic from the state row star by just taking the star measurements, right? So these statistics would be compatible with both states, and these two are not equivalent. Now, you can self-test plenty of stuff anyway, and there are many examples known. What is interesting is that, what I find interesting among other things is that uh, all the examples that are known so far can be self-tested sequentially from the bipartite case. That's an idea in this paper uh, that has been generalized in this one. Uh, so the idea is I have a multipartite state, and then you say, okay, for one of the inputs, I will just look at one of the outputs of these two guys. This creates a conditional state on Psi AB. Now I self-test this fellow, self-test and permute. And then if you permute enough many times, you, you get to self-test some, uh, some states, for instance, graph states, for instance, DK states, and, uh, well, quite a list. You can look in this paper for the list of the states that we know nowadays can be self-tested. And I want to finish with something I learned last week, uh, thanks to someone who understands uh, computer science papers. Uh, I need someone to translate them for me normally. So, so this is the natural, I would say, non-locality partition I showed you before. And now, uh, in this paper by G, uh, he had another idea. It's not exactly feasible in your labs, but uh, I find it interesting. So the idea is, I take my two boxes, and then encode it with an error-correcting code. For instance, this is two qubits. OK, this I need eight qubits here, eight qubit there. This is, should be done physically, though, not mathematically. So I create this state, and then I implement an error-correcting code. So I encode that state in eight boxes here, Alex, Alex state, eight boxes on Bob's side. And now I distribute these boxes, sorry, th these things to, to the player. So it's not this partition, but it's rather the partition across the uh, qubits of the error correcting code. And you need eight players. And we say, well, yeah, that's very good now. So we started from two players, we ended up with eight. Well, what's the advantage? Um, well, the advantage is that this construction works for any state, and he proved that you can self-test, for, self for instance, um, stabilize a state, graph state, of any number of parties with this idea. So you give you a cluster state, for instance, the one that's used for measurement-based quantum computing. Each qubit, you do this error-correcting uh, encoding. Now you distribute, you have eight things, eight lattice states, of course, all are entangled and so on. You distribute each lattice to each of the player, and then they start making local measurements or, or global measurements, whatever they can do, and then there is a criterion that self-test the cluster state. But it's interesting, right? Um, anyway, there are many more other things that have been done, so uh, I decided to stop here. I can, I mean, I can mention other things if you want. Uh, so nothing. Thank you for your attention.